All right, in the last couple lessons, we focused on the coronary circulation, which is an important thing to understand, especially in the setting of our 12-lead EKG interpretation. Along with the blood supply to the heart, it's also really important to understand the conduction system, as without this, the heart really wouldn't be able to do the work that it needs to do. So in this lesson, we're going to dive into that here. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Now, I do also have to take this time for a quick plug for ICU Advantage Academy. If you guys have enjoyed watching these videos here on YouTube, and you also have an annual requirement for CEs, so whether this is for your nursing license, CCRN, or any other certification, I am now an approved provider for continuing education. So if you join ICU Advantage Academy, uh, follow the link down in the description. Uh, over there, you can watch the videos that I offer here, but also earn CE credits for it while you're doing it. In addition to that, you also have access to the audio-only versions if you just want to listen to the lessons, as well as you have access to the notes that I prepare for each lesson. I'm also in the process of revamping these notes for Academy members uh, to make them look even better and more concise and just a better resource for, for everybody over there as well. So if you want to earn those CE credits, definitely head on over there and become a member. Uh, otherwise, if you really aren't looking for the CE credits, but you still want some perks like uh, access to the original style notes uh, and additional things, and you can always become a YouTube or Patreon member, uh, both of those links are down in the description as well. Okay, so as mentioned when we were talking about our coronary blood supply, it is important to understand that our heart is a mechanical pump. Along with the necessary blood supply bringing oxygen and electrolytes that are vitally needed, there's also another important part that is what actually makes everything work. And this is the electrical conduction system. And that's what's really responsible for the spark that initiates contraction and thus the function of this mechanical pump. Without the functioning of this system, our heart would not be able to function properly and thus blood would not make its way around the body. So speaking of the electrical conduction system, knowing the importance of this system for the function of the heart, hopefully you can understand why it's important to understand the components and how all this works. So our EKG, as we are going to discuss here soon, is only a measure of electrical activity and not any mechanical activity of the heart. Therefore, any changes on how the system is functioning not only are going to change how the heart works, but also change the appearance of the activity that we see on EKG. So our heart is made up of specialized cells or myocytes. Now we have many different types, but the main ones that we want to focus on here are the ones for pacemaking, signal transmission, and contraction. The purpose of these cells and the system is to generate the electrical activity uh, that's going to lead to contraction of cardiac muscle cells, as well as to ensure that this activation signal reaches all the parts of the heart in an appropriate amount of time. And this system of cells exists throughout the myocardial tissue. So let's talk about the different components of this electrical conduction system. We'll walk through the parts of the system one by one, and I'll briefly describe the purpose of each one. So here, this is an internal view of the heart, which we're going to use to map out the pathway of this conduction system. So first off is going to be the sinoatrial node, or what we refer to as the SA node. So this is located in the right atrium, and this is near the junction with the superior vena cava. And this is the start of the electrical conduction system, and it's really the heart's main pacemaker. The activation of the SA node is what triggers atrial contraction to propagate from one atrial myocyte to the next. And it's important to know that we've got the fibrous tissue uh, of the septum that's dividing both our left and our right side, as well as our atria and ventricles. This actually prevents the transmission of signal. And in about 60% of people, they have their SA node that's perfused by our right coronary artery. The rest of the people are mostly perfused by the left coronary artery, although there are some people that are supplied by both. 
Now next from here, we have something that we call Bachman Bundle. This is a specialized tract of cells that's responsible for carrying the signal from the SA node to the left atrium to ensure that really they're contracting together. This consists of high-speed transmission cells that travel from the SA node across the atrial septal wall to the left atrium. Now next we have our internodal pathways, and there's three different internodal pathways. We refer to them as the anterior, middle, and posterior. And these are primarily responsible for taking the signal from the SA node and passing it along to the AV node. So speaking of which, we have our atrioventricular node or the AV node. The AV node here is located again in the right atrium. This time it's near the coronary sinus and the tricuspid valve. This group of cells is specialized for the purpose of delaying the signal from the SA node briefly before sending it along to the ventricles. This delay is important as it's going to allow time for the atria to contract and thus completely fill the ventricles prior to their contraction. Now the AV node is exclusively supplied by the right coronary artery. Alright, next is something that we call the bundle of Hiss. And this is another set of high-speed transmission cells that comes off the AV node. So this travels partially in the wall of the right atrium and then into the interventricular septum before it branches to the left and right ventricles. Now in pathologically normal individuals, this is the only route of communication that exists between the atria and the ventricles. And the bundle of Hiss eventually bifurcates into two branches. So the first one is going to be our right bundle branch or RBB. And this is one of those two branches of bundle of Hiss. So these high-speed transmission cells are what are responsible for carrying that signal to the right ventricle. The right bundle branch terminates into our Purkinje fibers, which we'll cover in just a second here. Now next we have our left bundle branch, or our LBB, and this is another branch off that bundle of Hiss. Uh, as expected, this is another high-speed transmission fiber of cells that's responsible for carrying signal to fibers that will go to parts of the left ventricle. Now, due to the sheer size of the left ventricle, our left bundle branch actually divides into two more fibers to better cover the entire ventricle. So the first one we're going to talk about is the left posterior fascicle. This is actually the first branch off the left bundle branch, and this fiber actually has a fan-like appearance to it, and it's responsible for carrying the signal to the posterior and inferior portions of the left ventricle. Now because of the wide distribution of this fiber that we see with that fan-like appearance, it's actually the most difficult one to develop a block in. Now from here we have our left anterior fascicle, and this is the other branch of the left bundle branch. So this is a single-stranded fiber that sends signal to the anterior and superior parts of the left ventricle. And then finally we have our Purkinje fibers. And these are actually coming off each of the bundle branches and the fascicles are the cells that really connect with the myocytes. So you'll see them as just additional extensions coming off like our right bundle branch block here as well as the left bundle branch when we're looking at the left anterior fascicle as well as the left posterior fascicle giving it really that fan-like appearance. These are what are responsible for initializing depolarization in the muscle cells, leading to contraction of the cardiac muscle. Again, like the atrial myocytes, uh, the ventricular myocytes further propagate the signal to the other surrounding cells, just at a much slower speed than the high-speed bundles in the fascicles do. Alright, so that's the physical makeup of the electrical conduction system. One important aspect to know with the system is about the pacemaker ability of each of the different cells. So the pacemaking ability is really what dictates the heart rate that we see with our patient. Almost all parts that we just discussed of the conduction system have their own intrinsic pacemaker rate, which actually gets slower and slower as we move further down the system. And you can really think of this as the body's backup system. If a pacemaker higher up the chain fails to fire, after enough time has passed, a lower level pacemaker will fire to ensure that a contraction still takes place. As mentioned, the SA node is the primary pacemaker of the heart, and it has an intrinsic rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, the SA node also responds and adjusts its rate based on the needs of the body. Now, next, we have the AV node, which actually has an intrinsic rate of 45 to 50 beats per minute. Then the bundle of Hiss and the bundle branches each have a backup rate of 40 to 45 beats per minute. And then finally, the Purkinje cells and the ventricular myocytes themselves have a backup rate of around 20 to 40. 
Obviously, the slower rates of the system more distal to the SA node are either not ideal or in some cases life-threatening, they can buy the body time to correct itself or us more time to try and fix them. All right, so from here, I wanted to, to move on and talk about the electrophysiology of this system. I really wanted to just quickly describe the process of depolarization and repolarization of these cells to give you a better understanding of what's happening here. There are many electrolytes that play a vital role in this process, uh, and therefore the alteration in the levels of these electrolytes can and often do affect the function of the heart. Um, the main electrolytes that play a role in this process are sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride, although magnesium can also impact things as well. So we have our muscle cells here that we can see that are connected in these long fibers called myofibrils. The collection of these myofibrils are what make up muscle fibers, uh, and then collections of those obviously make up our muscles. Within each muscle cell, though, we have strands of this myosin and actin, which when activated with the help of calcium, the strands move along one another, causing contraction of the cell. As these cells and the cells of these myofibrils all contract, they decrease in size, leading to the contraction that we see. So then from here, it's important to understand about cell polarity. So the fluid inside the myocyte consists of a different concentration of ions than what exists outside the cell. Naturally, the concentration of ions wants to balance out across a semi-permeable membrane, aka our cell membrane. These cells, though, have a specialized pump, something that we call the sodium-potassium pump, that works to help to keep this in balance. So it actually pumps three sodium ions out of the cell while bringing two potassium ions in, all with the help of ATP. So by doing this, we're moving more positive ions out than we're bringing back in, so it actually creates a relatively negative environment inside the cell, consisting of a higher level of potassium, while outside the cell it consists of a higher level of sodium. This actually gives the cell a resting potential of around negative 70 to negative 90 millivolts. Now, as time passes, ions mainly sodium from outside the cell are actually going to leak into the cell, making it less and less negative. We can actually see this represented with the phases of an action potential, which I'm going to graph out for you here. Um, and this is called phase four of the action potential. And here you can see the slow rise of the polarity of the cell from that resting potential. Now, once the polarity has increased to a certain threshold level, a specialized set of channels open up, something that we call fast sodium channels. So this is really a one-way channel that's going to allow sodium, a positive ion, to quickly enter into the cell, rapidly rising the charge of the cell, eventually matching the outside polarity, something that we call depolarization. And this is what we actually consider phase zero with our action potential that you can see here with the sharp rise up. And again, this depolarization is then transmitted from cell to cell until they are all depolarized. Now, when the cell reaches its peak charge or it's really maximally depolarized, the sodium influx is going to be slowed down, and then we're going to start to have a leak of negatively charged chloride ions that are leaking into the cell as well. This slowdown actually leads to the closing of those fast sodium channels and then opening of two other channels that we call the slow sodium channels and the calcium channels. This is what we see as a small drop from the peak, something that we call phase one of the action potential here. Now, next, as the sodium is slowly entering and we have this influx of calcium, we really kind of maintain a relatively flat polarity, something that's known as the plateau phase or phase two that we see on the action potential here. Now, remember that calcium plays a vital role in the ability of myosin and actin to bind, and thus this is where the physical contraction is really beginning. Also, the more calcium that's available, the stronger and the longer the contraction that we're going to see. Now, from here, we start to have some potassium channels that are going to open, and this is going to allow potassium, which is at a higher concentration in the cell, to actually leave the cell, leading to a, a fairly quick drop in the polarity of the cell. You can see that here on our graph of the action potential, and this is what we refer to as phase three. So this eventually leads to a negative charge again for the cell, uh, effectively repolarizing it. Once we get back to that resting potential, so again, negative 70 to negative 90 millivolts, once that's reached again, um, at this point, all the channels will have been closed, and then we have our sodium potassium pump that goes back to work, and this process starts all over again with that slow increase of phase four. Now, the speed at which phase four creeps back up 
is fastest within the SA node myocytes and then get slower and slower the more distal we go in the conduction system. This is what leads to the slowing of that intrinsic or backup rate that we see. So this was a lot of information that we covered pretty quickly here, um, but it definitely is vital to understanding this conduction system from its parts to how it all works, as it is gonna directly impact the function of the heart and then ultimately what we observe with our EKG. Understanding these changes that you see and what they mean uh, are really gonna be important in recognizing what's going on, and more importantly, giving us the information we need to treat our patient. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.